Welcome, friends. And I want to say a huge thank you. I so appreciate you, the listeners. We have hit over 50,000 downloads and the year isn't even up. I'm so excited and I just want to show my appreciation by offering you some free downloads uh, for cycling. So if you go to askcoachsylvie.com, you can see all this in the show notes. I have some free downloads there that are cycling related. One is for organizing, one's for hill hill repeats. The other one is for bike maintenance. Um, they're totally free. You can share with your friends. Um, and I'd love to know what you think, but go to askcoachsylvie.com, get them today. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram for more amazing cycling tips and coaching tips and winter training programs are going to be launched very soon. So make sure that if you haven't got something to organize your winter, that maybe this is something to look at. So anyways, have an amazing day and I'll catch you in the episode. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Secrets in the Saddle, All Things Cycling Podcast with your host, Sylvie Dow. And we have a super special guest here, Marianne Clignet. Clignet? I know, I, like I, I throw the French accent in there. <laughs> Miriam Clignet. <laughs> anyway, she is, well, we're going to get it right. We're going to get it right. But she is such a wealth of knowledge. She's been around the cycling world for a couple decades. Um, she has some amazing information she's going to share with us, but her background um, started, she started racing in 1990. Okay. I was just graduating high school in 89. Let's just put that <laughs> in perspective. And she started in the U S she raced at a national level, brought back some medals, but she was not, um, selected for the team because she had developed epilepsy and that is when she moved to France and this is where her whole history in cycling started with um, or uh, creating the organization AFCC and she's going to talk about that uh, later and also working with the women's CPA which is also organizations in and around Europe. Am I right Marion? World world. All right. So I am super friend, super excited to have her here. I know that that intro did not do her justice because she has such a list of accolades. I have them all here, <laughs> but she is a, um, she is a coach. She lives in France and she's also a, um, a public speaker. And I'm just super excited to have her here. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's in English, it would be Marion Clignet and in French, it would be Marion Clignet. So oh, Marion. Marion. Yeah. Yeah. Marion so, um, hey, uh, I got a little bit yeah. of English and French in there. <laughs> I actually, I started riding a bike in 86 after, um, learning I had epilepsy. And the first thing the neurologist told me was, um, your driver's license will be suspended for mm. one year effective now. And you shouldn't go outside, you shouldn't do any sports, you shouldn't talk hmm. about it because epilepsy is very taboo and blah, blah, blah. And my first yeah. reaction was anger and then a little bit of frustration, deception, and sort of wonder, mm -hmm. like, why would I not be able to do any sports and to do other things? And because I couldn't drive, I had to get to work, which was 30 kilometers away somehow. So I started <laughs> looking in the Washington Post want ads because I lived in Maryland at the time and found what I called my hunk of junk, a green machine. Ah, your bicycle? Yeah. Yep, a green bike. <laughs> it was a Nord de France. So that was, I mean, that brought out the French side in me and I, I was super excited. It was uh, $200 and it was just, I mean, it was a steel frame. I think it was a 57 and I ride a 51. So that <laughs> shows that, yeah, I didn't know anything about bikes, but, it, and it was this really kind of, ugly green, but it was, I mean, it was what got me to work and back. So yeah. all of a sudden in 86, I started riding 60 K a day to work and back. And, and I became what I fondly call an endorphin junkie and, um, mm. just, yeah, really started to, to thrive on, um, the rides to and from work and the wind, the rain, the snow, I just 
feeling everything. And um, one day when I got to work, I, what I started to do was to cut down the time um, that it would take me to get to work. I'd leave, uh -huh. instead of leaving at 20 of, I'd leave at a quarter to, a 10 to, to see if I could still make it to work on time. And that was the pressure that would push me harder. Yeah. So I was getting to work more and more red faced and huffing and puffing and sweaty. <laughs> and finally, one guy that I worked with said, are you training for something? And I, I, I burst out laughing and I said, no, I'm just commuting, but you know, I'm kind of having fun with it. And he was really into racing and he was quite a good cyclist. And he said, well, why don't you come and try a race? There's a, a criterium on Sunday at <laughs> College Park. And I was like, a what? A yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously, a what? <laughs> yeah, I've never ridden with anyone other than my bike. And I, you know, I'd be mortified if I had made anyone crash or anything. And he said, just come, just give it a try. So, so I show up with underwear on under my chamois, wool socks, a <laughs> shirt with the sleeves cut off. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, everything that, you know, a chain mark on my leg, I mean, the whole bit. And and I so I rode the course a few times. I rode it forward and then I rode it backwards just to see what it was all about and had no clue about drafting or pace lines or anything. And um, so it was a 2.1 circuit with one sharp turn, a little, a small climb, a small descent and a sweeping turn. And um, I, yeah, I just set myself up on the front line for the start because <laughs> I wanted to be ready for the start. And all of a sudden at the start line, I he heard this buzz. I hear these girls behind me go, oh my God, look at that girl. And look, she's got a chain ring mark on her leg and she's got underwear on under her chamois. And oh my gosh. She doesn't even have cycling pedals and blah, 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 you know, just on and on. So I'm ah. thinking to myself, all right, I basically have two choices here. Either I'm going to be directly off the back, which is the most logical thing that will happen or somehow I can use my power and just hang on for dear life and and you know grab the last person that goes by and just try to hang on and uh so all of a sudden I mean I'm, I'm pulled out of my thoughts by this guy counting at the microphone going three two uh. one a gunshot which absolutely scared the shit out of me and I just took off and at the time the gears were 5312 and I put it in the 5312 and just sprinted for all I was worth to the front and then just went as hard as I could and stayed at the front and had everybody, you know, behind me. And <clears throat> every time someone tried to come up to pass me for their own safety, I'd accelerate because I was afraid that, you know, in the turns I'd go bowling and take people out. I mean, that was the biggest fear I had was that I would cause a, a crash. And so after five laps or so, I'm still in front and everyone's, you know, behind. And when they try to come up, I'd go faster. And all of a sudden my friend Steve starts telling me, Marion, get some cover, cover yourself. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, it's really hot outside. <laughs> what are you talking I'm about? Up the sky, there's <laughs> nothing falling and I'm getting cover from what? And then a few laps later, he's telling me to grab a wheel, grab a wheel. And, I, and so I started riding by doing this so I wouldn't get you know, distracted by him because I had no idea what he was talking about. And I just, I managed to stay at the front for, it was 40K. And I think until like three, 400 meters to go last lap, three girls came around me and I ended up fourth. And um, the girl who won, I still remember her name. She was racing for UVA um, in Charlottesville. Her name was Heather Morris. And so I went to see her and I was, I was like a groupie. I was so excited. I was like, wow, that was so cool. You know, what can I do to progress? And I remember she went like this and gave me the once over and said, first thing, don't wear underwear under your chamois. You'll figure it out when you pee that it's really gonna hurt. And you know, change the bike, it's gotta go. I mean, it's too big, it's, or clean it and do something, get pedals, you know, do, just redo everything. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was that bad. And, but she, you know, she was encouraging. She said, you've got the strength, we saw that, but you know, you, you've got to now uh, tighten things up or whatever, so. After that, Steve took me under his wing and I started riding with him more and riding with other guys and a really close and one of the first really strong men that I rode with, his name was Jim, just passed away last Friday, unfortunately, but he was, mm -hmm. he was way before his time. He, he rode with a lot of women and encouraged them to be strong and fast. So we're talking late eighties. He was way before his time. Right. And, and just was always so excited to have women riding with him on the bike and was like, God, you guys are so strong. This is so cool. Go. And um, so he was, you know, just like a huge uh, motivator as was Steve. And then there was a guy in New Jersey named Mike Frazee 
who had put together. I know Mike Frazee. There you go. He had you, put together a lot of women's teams. and um, I've been to his place. Yes. A couple of yes, times. In New York. Yeah. Oh my gosh. He is yes. so amazing. He and is, yeah. him and his wife, like his stories. Oh, oh my amazing. God. I love him. He's, oh, he's fantastic. Oh. So I went there I, three times. Three, oh. uh, yeah. For, for camps or? Yeah. Well, I, I organized uh, groups and what he'd do, it was like an all included, um, we would ride. And uh, he would always follow us with his car or he would um, give us like he'll, you know, like, um, you know, drills to do in the front yard or down the street from him. And, you know, and it was and he would entertain us at supper with like oh. over wine. And oh, my, his place is like um, it's like a shrine. It's like a, a museum. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, well, my gosh, you know, Mike. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I raced with I mean, he really helped mm -hmm. me to get started. I raced with their team and yeah. um, Betsy King raced for him. And she was I mean, she's, you know, like a, a monument in U.S. women's cycling. Susan Elias, Betsy Davis, Inga Thompson. Inga was I met out west when we first started racing. But yeah, these I mean, these were all um, pillars, if you will, of mm -hmm. my uh, cycling debut so yeah anyway so um so i started riding in 86 and worked my way up to the national level um and even international level in 1990 and um i moved to reno nevada to to work a little bit with inga who was my mentor and and you know my my cycling idol at the time and she really took me under her wing taught me a lot um i went and did the tour of norway we did a training camp and Argentina and raced with the men there and she actually was the first person to encourage me to race with the men so I started doing oh. a lot of men's races and, and that was full on I mean it was totally different than mm. you know, with the women and um, the races were longer were harder and uh, really I mean I was still looking for my limits so it really pushed me to push myself wow. harder and so you were able to race on like participate in a men's race like yeah. women were allowed to, or is it, was it just because there's so few women that no, I mean, it's, the they were was, the, Yeah. The, the level was different and there were, it, mm. you know, it was just a whole different um, scenario for us. And when I moved to France, it was the same thing. I mean, I, the women's racing, when I moved here um, locally or regionally, um, the races were too short and too slow for me to gain what I needed to be mm -hmm. competitive at the international level so i raced more with the men when i lived in Brittany than i did with the women locally right. um you right. know the women's race was going to be 40 to 60k whereas the men's race was going to be 90 to 130k right. and that's what international women's races were distance wise so it made more sense for me to race with the men and now today i mean it's a different story you race with the women and it's as fast as a lot of those races we were doing back then you know at a certain mm -hmm. level so uh um, yeah. so tell us about your transition from being on a US team or riding for the US then making your decision to go to France. Well, you know, I mean finding out you know the first thing when I found out that I had epilepsy was that I had to um just continue and not let that mm -hmm. be a, a deterrent. Um the big issue in the beginning were the medications was finding a medication that didn't have such strong side effects that I wouldn't be able to get out of my own way. And that was right. a big problem. Um, the first medication, I slept 19 out of 24 hours. I lost 11 kilos. And then the second medication, I put on 14 kilos and I was hyperactive all the time. So, you know- <laughs> Is there was, an in-between here where I can Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and the, at this time, you know, new meds for epilepsy were just coming out and being trialed. So it, it was it was a difficult time. And then throughout my career, I kept hearing about another new medication. And I was just hoping that at some point something would come out that wouldn't have any side effects. And um, so I ended up making a lot of changes along with that nutritionally and mm -hmm. um, training wise and, and got it wrong quite a few times. I mean, I thought that because of epilepsy, I'd have to ride a lot more than other people to keep my weight in check. Um, right. And that brought on other issues with food and, and, and diet mm -hmm. and all that, which a lot of women go through anyway. But um, I, you know, I trained too hard to be told that I couldn't 
go to the worlds because I had epilepsy. And I felt that there was something behind that, that maybe that wasn't Mm -hmm. the real reason that maybe my character was too strong. And because I have dual citizenship anyway, I had the French women had come over and done the tour of Idaho with us. And oh, yeah, I raised with Inga's team. We had put together a team called um, Cal Neva. Um, I think it was called, it was, yeah, Cal Neva. It was um, the Reno based team. Can you still hear me? Because you've, the screen is frozen. Okay. Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay, All right. Your just frozen. Um, so we, we, I think we won five stages. Inga won the overall. I took the points jersey. Um, and it, it was it was a pretty intense race, and the the French women had come over, and I had exchanged quite a bit with them, and they told me, well, you know, if you ever come over, let us know. We have a good club in Brittany, and there's tons of races in August, and blah blah blah. So that nationals was uh, the the announcement was on Sunday. So on Sunday, I called them and I said, hey, do you guys still have that offer <laughs> that I can come over, you know, and race with you and and finish up the season? I wasn't selected for Worlds and. Um, I, I don't want to end the season on a disappointment. I want to keep my season going because my form is here. And and so they said, yeah, come over. And, you know, for, you know we're, we're doing a lot of races in Brittany. So I went over and, and learned quite a bit. And um, I was racing with Valérie Simonet and um, Danny Bonron, Cécile Audin, who were all pillars of the French national team. And then there, too, started racing with the men. And that blew the men away because back in the... 90s I mean women weren't racing with the men yet so it was pretty full on and 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 right away found a good training group you know a good group of guys to race with and train with and Brittany is really the 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 center of cycling in France I mean it's that's everybody races there it's really a national sport whereabouts is that Brittany Brittany is the northwest of France so it's a windy and rainy region (laughs) Oh, and, really? you know, the only morons who are out when it's Sounds pleasant. Rainy, windy are the cyclists <laughs> and the surfers. So, uh, uh, yeah. oh, it's a lot of coast uh. on the, you know, there's a lot of coast on the water and then inland, there's a lot of hills. So it's, it's a great place to train. That's where Bernardino is from. Um, you know, is that a, down from Cannes? Is it on that side? It's up from Cannes. Cannes is south. South. Brittany okay, so then Nice? Brittany is north. Nice is in the south. Oh, okay. Yeah, Nice, the only reason, I mean, people live, some of the pros live down that way is Monaco, so they don't mm. have to pay taxes. And then they can train in the mm. back country okay. of Nice, but Nice itself to train is not actually, I mean, I don't think it would be too ideal, but. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So more than north. Okay, so I'm thinking, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's got yeah. another section. It's really, you know, you've got Normandy up north, that little part. Right, 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 right. And it's all below that, so. I know, I'm learning all my countries. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so did, now, can I ask you about your epilepsy? Did it hinder you in any way? And, and did, were there certain things that triggered your, it, did you have seizures regularly? Um. Or was it, it just had, a one it, occurrence that? No, it, no, there were, it, it came back. I mean, it was, it's really hard to say what provoked it, why mm-hmm. I had that first seizure. I had another one a few months later, which is what confirmed the diagnosis, but they right. still couldn't pinpoint any particular issue with the EEGs and MRIs and all that. So it was a really difficult um, uh, diagnosis to, uh, to explain. Um, so I had throughout my career between zero and three seizures a year and and I had to stay on medication. So, I mean, I was kind of lucky. And then eventually I was able to pinpoint the symptom that I would get before a seizure. And normally once I started having the symptoms, um, I'd have between two to four hours before the seizure. So I could put myself in safety. The biggest problem I had in the beginning was really recognizing and listening to the symptom because I kept telling myself that it had to be psychosomatic. And because I was strong mentally, I could be stronger than the seizure and will it away. But that doesn't happen. (laughs) uh, Mm. I learned uh, having a seizure at 47 kilometers an hour that on the bike that- (gasps) Did you really? I did. Yeah, I did. I had two seizures while riding, one um, out with the guys in Brittany and um, I broke, this tooth that I just got replaced. Um, I, I had it on a pivot, but it kept coming out. So they, I had an implant. Yeah, that was unfortunate. 
Um, I literally, when I fell, I literally bit the pavement and the tooth split in half and was hanging by the nerve. It was, it, yeah, it was horrifying. Um, and we spoke earlier about concussions. I, I had a massive concussion that I don't yeah, think I it's properly diagnosed right away. So um, I probably could have had more rest after that. But, uh, um, and then I had another one, um, God, I had another one riding, um, when was it? Anyway, yeah, I did have another one riding. And I had one, oh, I was wearing the yellow jersey at the Tour of Finisterre, International Bike Race, everyone was there. And I was warming up and I felt it coming on and I said, oh shit. Um, so I was making a U-turn to tell my director sportif that I was gonna have a seizure and that I probably shouldn't race. And I tumbled into the, the nettles and the rose bushes face first and had a seizure and my bike kept going and then fell in some tall grass. And after a seizure, it takes me, you know, the actual seizure is between 30 seconds to three minutes, but it's the post seizure that's the longest. Yeah. It takes me about 10, 15 minutes to really reconnect. And it, 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 from what people tell me, it looks like the old operators where they're putting, you know, line A with line A, line B with line B. So each mm -hmm. neuron is trying to connect and, so I'm a little bit amnesic. I don't know what happened and I, I'll repeat the same things. I mean, it's a lot of confusion. And so after the seizure, apparently I got up and started walking down the road in my cycling shoes and everybody was warming up on the, the road. And, you know, a couple of girls just kind of looked at me and one of my teammates stopped and said, where's your bike? And I was still kind of, you know, wherever I go when I have a seizure. And just at that point, I started coming to and I said, no idea. <laughs> and I, I just remember the color draining from her face and she just went sheet white and she said, don't move. I'll be right back. And, you know, she, she looked me over. So she saw that my face, I mean, everything was puffy from the nettles, from the rose bushes, I was scratched. And, and so the, the medical team t came to get me, they postponed the start of the race for 10 minutes. And then oh. it, it took them a while to find my bike. Cause it had, <laughs> um, yeah, it had fallen over in some tall weeds so they couldn't see it. Um, so they found my bike and then I was still, did you race? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was still coming out of the seizure. And I remember they said, so are you ready? Do you want to race? And I said, who won? <laughs> and they were like, no, you have the leader's Jersey. So would you like to race? And just after a couple of minutes, everything finally connected. And I said, yeah, okay, I'm all right. I can do this. Let's go. And yeah, I didn't think about it. And we had 110 K and from what doctors have told me, nettles stimulate your circulation. So if I had any pain from the day before, I wouldn't have felt it. And because I had the seizure, I had up to my pain threshold. So, and I think also I looked pretty scary. The girls were all kind of looking at me like, wow, is, is this okay? Cause I had, I mean, scrapes everywhere. And then we went off, you know, we took off for the race, 110 K and I think two or three kilometers from the finish, I attacked and, and just soloed in for the win. And that was it. But, um, oh my gosh, I definitely wouldn't recommend having a seizure before a race so, <laughs> or yeah. doing the race <laughs> or doing the race. But anyway, yeah, that was after that. I mean, I was, I finally had the sense to really listen to myself and, and I found some things to do to, um, to not have a seizure, but I, I had to stay calm that entire day. You know I mean? There right. were little things like putting some liquid, a particular liquid on a sugar cube that really calms you down a little bit like Valium, but it's a different molecule. And it Is it like adaptogen? Like um, adaptogen? No, that would have been nice. I couldn't find any <laughs> adaptogens at the time. No, it was Rivitril, which oh. is a, a strong molecule. And if you take too much, it's like you've drank in three liters of wine. But yeah, it's, uh, no, I mean, I, an adaptogen would have been awesome. And I've tried to find some over the years, but with the Chinese in particular, but it's, it's. I might be able to help you with that, but I'll talk, we'll talk about that yeah, after. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, but, yeah, so yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot out there in terms of um, herbs and I've, I've tried, you know, making the switch a few times, but it's yeah. uh, not an easy one anyway. Um, I think so now you're you're settled obviously yeah. um you I just moved to the Pyrenees from Toulouse um, I'm living Ooh. in just across from the Utacam um so I'm at the foot of the mythic tour climbs the Tourmalet is 
about a 20, 25K warm up, the Col de Tente, Col de Bordère, I mean, uh, Soulor Robisque, uh, just fabulous rides. Um, there's I think I'm coming over. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we could travel. No, it's awesome. I mean, it really. So this morning, I rode the Utakam. I did, and there's great gravel rides here too. Uh, more and more people are getting into gravel just to avoid, you know, cars. It's the same cars. here. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's the same here. So tell me now that you've um, you've like you're now settled. What are you up to? Because you've had a an amazing career of all sorts of uh, wins, um, you've, um, geez, I'm not going, but I'll, I'm going to put them all in the show notes. But um, you know, you've been an entrepreneur. Um, you do public relations communications, like you're a public speaker. You also wrote a book back in 2004, like. What are you up to now? Because we talked a little bit about um, your participation in, you were talking about the organizations that you have, the AFCC and um, the Women's uh, CPA. So let's yep. talk a little bit about those. And, yep. um, and I know like this is going to tie into women's equality in sport and you're working a lot on that in, well, globally, I guess. Uh, internationally but for cycling yeah let's talk um french cycling i mean seemed like it was much more ahead of what it is now in the early 90s when i first started racing mm -hmm. um there was a higher level there were a lot of races that have all stopped um there was the the tour de load which was sort of like the tour of texas back in the day it was like the big get together at the beginning of the season for the entire world of, of women cycling. Um, there was the Tour de la Drôme, Tour d'Ardèche. I mean, there was uh, the Tour de Vendée, Tour de Epinal. I mean, wow. Just all these phenomenal races. And That's pretty cool. none of them exist anymore. So hmm. um, in 2019 at the French National Championships, um, myself and a few other women, some retired, some still actively racing, got together and said, let's create a, a, sort of like a syndicate, but except yeah. that since we weren't considered professional, we couldn't call it a syndicate. It had to be called an association. Mm -hmm. So we created the association, which is called the Association Française des Coureurs ES Cyclistes. So it's the French Association of Women Cyclists. And the mm -hmm. first objective was to get the women who had contracts to race their bikes recognized as professional athletes because that changes the game when they go to a bank they ask for a loan when they you know do administrative tasks their taxes are different a lot of things are different so mm. we had to negotiate for eight months with the federation until they finally said oh you're right yes these women who are in the world tour actually do have a contract to race their bikes so we'll put a stamp on it that recognizes them as professional the difference with the oh. men professional in france is that their license is not given by the Federation, it's given by the League of Professional Cycling, but the League of Professional Cycling still does not have a women's section. So oh. we, yeah, we've been able to get women represented at the League by placing somebody at their meetings. And because this is something the French do really well, they're trying to politicize all of this and saying, okay, so once you've had a meeting with the organizers, the racers, the racers and the organizers and the managers <laughs> and the managers and the racers and the organizers, then we'll talk about it and we'll see how many of oh. you are. And, you know, so, so anyway, we- <laughs> Way to try and discourage you, right? Oh, you got to get together with all these people and then we'll yeah, think about but, it. So we're onto it. We're, you know, we have weekly meetings, monthly meetings and, um, uh, you know, things are moving forward. We've already got the first step of getting these women in the world tour recognized as pros. And with the CPA women, which is the International Women's Cycling, Women's Professional Cycling Association, one thing that we're also working on is a joint accord for the continental teams. Because today it doesn't take much to be a UCI continental team and it's just a label. But mm. I think in order to have that label, you need to earn it. Just like a world tour team, you have to, um, you know, have, you've got a cahier de charge. There's like an agenda that you have to fulfill yeah, yeah. and to be able to be a world tour team. And they need to do the same thing for UCI Conti teams because 
that's where a lot of problems start. I mean, there's a lot of sexual abuse still happening in women's cycling and we're trying to work on that. And yeah, so we, I mean, battles have been won. The, I've heard it's very expensive too. A court cases are really expensive, but now what's happening is that- No, but like to, oh, to, to be a, a world part of a, yeah, like yeah. part of a world tour team. Like yeah, well it cheap. is, what really costs a lot is that you have to put in a bank guarantee in case you can't pay your riders, in case a sponsor backs out, you have to have oh. you have the money to pay your staff and your riders. So mm. that's, I mean, like in any, you know, a lot of different businesses, you would have the same um, requirements. So, so we're working, you know, on a lot of different things. One step forward is that the UCI no longer has three different commissions um, to handle an abuse case before it would have to go through the ethics commission, the disciplinary commission, and then the whatever commission of, that oversaw both of those. So it would take three times as long to get mm -hmm. things done. Now they've reduced it to just the ethics commission. So, you know, it, it gets seen and treated much with much more rapidity and efficiency. And, you know, so we're hoping that that will make a huge difference but um right yeah, there's a lot to do i mean there's a lot on safety you know we we have a lot of the same um tasks that the men have to work on but women's racing is different than men's racing so the, at some point it needs to be universal so we can work on all of these issues together but right um, you know men have paid a percentage of their salary for a long time to create a transition fund to help them when they retire women have just started racing professionally in 2000. So there is no transition fund to dip into to help them out of difficult situations. So that's they have a retirement fund. The men. Yeah. When, what? you know, when, yes, really? when men, yes. When they retire, they get just to announce their retirement. I mean, a lot of men get like between nine and 13,000 euros and the women it's like, bye, <laughs> you know, and then, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, no, wow. and then um, there's different things that are proposed to them to help guide them through their transition. And it's never enough because psychologically, you know, oh, you're it's never enough. going from six hours a day to nothing. Yeah. And, you know, your raison d'etre was always getting up to ride and watching mm -hmm. everything. And all of a sudden, all of that stops. So there is um, a South African who lives in Germany who's put together a universal program for men oh. and women, for everybody who's been presenting that to the CPA. So we're working on that with him. And that's really cool because that's so it's like a trans, really it's like a retirement transition program, accompaniment. Something, yes. Accompaniment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something to really help guide a platform. Canada a has platform. something like that for yeah. Olympic athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's I mean, pretty hard. It is them. hard. I mean, when you see what happened yeah. to uh, Liv, Olivia Podmore, the young Kiwi who just took her life. I mean, she wasn't selected. She was a sprinter and you know, don't know exactly what happened but she qualified a spot for the sprints and she wasn't taken and she ended up taking her life so mm. that I mean it just showed and she was young she was 24 I mean so wow it's, it's you know it happens um even when people are older and they retire and all of a sudden they're lost mm -hmm. they can sink into depression or whatever but I mean uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it's a it is a, a surprising, like when I, um, I've interviewed uh, quite a few of the Canadian uh, Olympic team, or even some of the Canadian pro ladies Olympics, and some are in Europe. And uh, just to ask them, you know, asking them, you know, what's their five year plan, you know, retirement, a lot of them are still in school. Yeah, just surprising. Yeah, like, those A personalities, right? They can pull, pull it off. Well, women <laughs> actually multi and multi multitask. I mean, in yeah. France, most I was of the surprised women, actually. Yep. Most um, of the, the continental women race, work, and go to school. Oh wow! So, yeah. So it's it's difficult. I mean, and and that that makes it even more difficult to be able to up your game to be competitive at racing, which is why oh, a lot of sure. women end up stopping. So yeah, plus the family. Mm -hmm. Plus happens. family, yeah. I mean, if you want to have kids and and you want to create a family and mm -hmm. um, or find someone to do that with, you know, it's Who's not uh, a racer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's not. Yeah, 
not easy. <laughs> so what, what kind of, besides this, I mean, you've got lots of projects on the go. What can you tell us about um, things that we should keep our eye out for? Like we were just talking about the women's tour de France. It yeah. was just announced like during the men's tour de France for next year. Is yeah. that going to be, that's a shorter version to start, okay. right? Isn't it? So um, the CPA yeah, let's talk about have been involved with that, with the, okay. marketing, with the announcement. Um, we've been um, in close contact with Christian Prudhomme and his marketing team, which are women, two women, um, <laughs> which is a first. And, and so yeah. we've been in touch with them. We um, uh, consulted with them, well, advised them on who to contact in terms of women racers to to kind of do a, a day in the life of, to, to build what they wanted to do is try to do a, a starification. So the public, mm. the general public knew who these women were. Yeah. So um, I think that's something that's in the process. They wanted to show people that there are women who are moms, who are working, who are studying, uh, you know, mm. studying on the road and, and that women are multitasking and that they, you know, they have, it's, it's a different Peloton, a different group than the men. I mean, overall, the women have a much higher education um, because they haven't been able to, to race, yeah. um, well, they're, they're not getting the same money. So it's, it's a different game, but now, you know, the salaries are progressively increasing and women are starting to, you know, to be able to make a living from it. But anyway, um, that's happening. And our association in France is also going to organize the first ever Women's International Tour of the Pyrenees in 2022, August Ooh. 19th through 22nd. Okay. So it'll be four stages in three days um, between Pau, Lourdes, and uh, Pierrefitte and the Soulor. So there'll, there'll be a bit of climbing, there'll be a team time trial, um, a circuit race, and two long stage races, two long road races. Um, so we're still working on, uh, you know, we've got the sponsors, we've got the towns. Um, we're still working on finalizing just the little details uh, um, and hoping that we'll get um, enough of an extra budget that we can really be on top of it prize money wise. Um, oh, that'd be nice. That's eh? something that I've always found disappointing, especially mm -hmm. it was, I think it was Amstel that, and, and, Marik uh, uh, Van Vluten won and she won 1500 euros and the men's winner won 16,000 and I just thought that was such shit so, yeah wow so that I'm that's telling you Miriam I um I'm a an event organizer I have a women's cycling club I didn't mm -hmm. get to tell you that but here in uh, Chelsea around Ottawa and uh we started um we put an, a race event on the Quebec circuit. Uh, so it was, it's uh, sanctioned by the Quebec Federation. And um, that was one thing because I was like, they have like a kind of like a, a, a little chart as to who gets the percentage wise of, of race money, right? Mm -hmm. Or the race organizer can decide how much money they're gonna give out. So. I have always made it a point of having the same race money winnings for men and women. Um, and I also honor like some of the masters women too, being a master, but, uh, and I think that's super important um, yeah. because, uh, you know, the, the senior one, two women work as hard as the senior men's and uh, usually they're the ones who are, traveling to to come or they're trying to um break into the circuit the pro pro circuit either here in canada well i know so much here in canada but finding a team here in canada but definitely going down to the united states so yeah there, there's a few canadians too mm -hmm. in europe um emily fortin mm -hmm. is racing for biscaya in spain um she's coached by the guy i rode with today uh Pascal Hervé, um, and there are some. Yeah, there's a couple others. Um, uh, any? Is it any? I'm trying to think of her. Her and her boyfriend Sean Clark. I can remember his name. I can't remember her. Uh, any Prudhomme? It's not any Prudhomme, or is it? I'm just trying to think here. Andrian. Ar Ariane. I think. 
and uh, they're uh, they're both in Spain. Okay. Well, yeah. they're probably in Girona, which seems to be where a lot of people. Yeah, and they uh, she raced at um, in, for the Olympics, uh, Team Canada as well. Okay. Um, yeah. What's her name? Well, here, just hold on. <laughs> hold on, let me just double check here because, like, there's there's a group of them. They all started on the same team here in Ottawa. Okay. So they're basically recruited by the same woman, Jenny, and uh, Jenny True. I don't know if that name's come across uh, your, um, no. and, and they all look alike. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like, wow. um, yeah. So, uh, no, Carol Ann, Carol Ann, um, uh, Cru Cruel, Carol Ann. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yep, yep. So yep. she, yeah. So she raced a uh, time trial and she did the road uh for the in places yes and I, I don't remember was she racing for tibco or for rally or oh i can't remember what she's who she's yeah, racing her, her, for right now her, yeah okay yeah she's one of the uh, episodes but uh yeah so she's she came in through like she's from quebec actually gatineau not far from where i am but all these girls like we're all recruit raced together and a lot of them went to track a lot of them went to like you know and it was just yeah. crazy because I was like, oh my God, you were coached by her too. <laughs> it's just like she recruited all these. I mean, she's she was such a talent seeker. Wow. Uh, Jenny True. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's that's a huge yeah. uh, asset to have. And it and it takes, I mean, it takes a lot of oomph to, you know, to go out and find the talent and, and mm -hmm. to encourage them to, you know, it's almost like selling. She's got to be able to make the sell to bring. Oh, them. I don't think she had any problem. Yeah. She, she <laughs> From what I understand, but she was one of the, the ladies, she had a, a pro, um, she was racing pro and over a couple of concussions, she was forced to finally stop. retire. Oh. And okay. then she came to Ottawa and started coaching. Cool. And so kids, and then she coached for, um, uh, well, it's part of her, a bike shop cyclery. And then she started recruiting these girls into their women's team. Awesome. And then she just like took them like to, wow. and now she's at the Milton track. She's running their junior development program. Far like, oh okay. yeah. Like yeah i'll send you her episode but she's oh yeah <laughs> she's so funny Great. but but you know what you could tell that she she pulled out and find found girls who had like very similar personalities and yeah. and just like the um the fortitude to go and race at such a high level and and train as well so it's just it's just amazing like that grouping of girls um yeah. but uh anyways she's uh crazy I've raced in um, one of my first like big international wins was the uh, Canadian Grand Prix Tire Classic in 91. And was that in Montreal? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, we had the time trial on the bike path. Um, it okay. Was, I think it was 5K. And um, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. That was fast. Cool. And um, then the next day was the, the race, the circuit race up the Mont Royal. Yeah, and that was that's awesome. still happening. Yeah, so and that was cool. That was the the best, um, one of the best money, fin like financial races I had ever had at that time. It was ten thousand dollars, I think, for the the weekend wow. because I won the GC and the climbers jersey, and I think Catherine won the combined jersey or the sprint jersey or something. I mean, we 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 really racked it up. And then the the last day there was a circuit race on the Tour de Lille, but that was. Okay. Um, I just remember the road being like potholes and, and pretty <laughs> fine, <laughs> but, uh, but it, no, it was a cool event. And uh, I mean, it was, um, I think, um, if I remember right, Louis Garneau was maybe one of the sponsors or had a, had a, did he have a women's team at the time? I don't know. Um, he probably, cause he's always had, yeah. uh, he's Montreal based. Yeah. So he's always had like, uh, teams. I've oh. seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a great race. But what, I, what year was that? 91. 1991. 91. Oh my gosh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. When God was a child. <laughs> God was a child. Oh, really? <laughs> but so, so now you're doing some great things. So you're working 
what is it, what is it, what is taking up all your time right now with regards to, uh, to cycling? I mean, I know, I know you're still cycling. I saw your, yeah. uh, you're yeah, no, I'm still, still very walking. active cycling wise. Right. Uh, you were saying yeah. something about like training camps at your place in France. Yeah. Um, possibly what's, yeah. what's going on with you for yeah. like, right. Like currently, I know you spoke about the organizations and like, you know, for the next three years. Uh... Well, I just bought this house in December. It was a major fixer upper. It was built in 47 and just needed, uh, you know, gutting out, rebuilding from the inside out, repainted everything. So I'm still waiting for my kitchen, but it's basically <laughs> the a, kitchen yeah, is always the last. <laughs> yeah, well, especially mine. It's a three story house already divided into three apartments. So I'm renting out the apartments below and I live on the top floor with a balcony that looks out onto the Utikam and pretty much surrounded by mountains. So it's a really cool little town. Um, a lot of fabulous rides, not far from the Tourmalet, from the Utikam, from Sulo, from Obisk, everything. So a lot of cyclists come here in the summer and then you can ski or snowshoe or do whatever in the wow. winter. So I'm this, I just opened you know, the rentals in August. So it's still, we're still in August. I mean, I've, I'm basically three weeks in and just starting to make some money back. I mean, I invested a lot to, to rebuild mm -hmm. everything. Um, um, I feel kind of like I'm camping in my own apartment because I'm still, <laughs> I'm doing my dishes in the bathroom sink. So at least oh, I have yeah. a bathroom sink to do them in. So, um, <laughs> and because the plumber and the electrician are on vacation, I can't, I do have the stove and the um, the tabletop stove um, positioned, but I can't get them to function because I need the electrician to do the, you know, oh, the you got and a barbecue. Then, same with the sink. No. And uh, yeah, no. So <laughs> I'm eating a lot of salads and nuts and grains. But anyway, um, <laughs> as of tomorrow, I'm working on a website with the friends. So to, to do my own marketing uh, right now, I'm going mm. through booking.com and um, some other local agencies, but it's, I'd rather have, my own connections with people so um the website will be uh villa villa de vacances no villa de vélo et vacances.com so oh all right yeah. well we'll we're gonna definitely have to add that so everybody by the time this is uh this is Online. launched yeah. <laughs> you can go and rent miriam's place in yeah. france yeah so the her link will be there so you can go and book yourself in and uh, if you could leave canada um or the u.s well, there's a group of canadians coming um what? To ride, uh, yeah to ride with uh, my friend i told you about um pascal so that they're oh nice they're doing 12 days the tour they're starting in barcelona and then coming up and doing uh, the pyrenees and uh, and wow. the, the pyrenees are really um, I prefer the Pyrenees to the Alps because it's, um, they're more, they're wild. They're more rustic, if you I will. Like wild. Um, they're harder. Yeah. Um, people are more open, friendlier. I mean, it's, it's a different atmosphere than the Alps. The Alps hmm. is, um, uh, I think more they're not so cycling friendly. I find well, that hard. I mean, to they've made big roads to accommodate cyclists, but it's not the same thing. Um, right. it's not as, uh, uh, wild you know do you still like when I ride up the Col de Spondel which is close by I often see deer in the woods I mean today oh, oh I see wow yeah in front of me. Um, so yeah I mean it's it's a different atmosphere hmm. so yeah wow well that is really cool so that's what's keeping you busy that, obviously and and, yeah, and and I organize um, for the last 13 years we've organized um, uh, a, a grand fundo uh, oh yeah cycle event in, yes talk about this yes okay so it's called la marion clinier we organize it in l'île jordan which is in the gers region it's about two hours from here it's not far from toulouse so there's an airport very close by um all the funds that we've earned in the beginning they went to find a molecule to treat epilepsy like a new molecule they would they mm -hmm. would go towards research and the last 10 years, we've been re um, recuperating the money to build a gym for a local school that's dedicated to epilepsy. So there's two schools in France, one in the north and one in the south, that are specifically dedicated to kids who have epilepsy. And this particular school didn't have a gym. And I, these kids need to be active. They need to be outside. Right. They need to, to know their bodies, to be able to move and function, especially 
the, some of these kids are having 30 seizures a day. So they really, mm. they're on so much medication. They need to be able to get sunlight, to get mm. outside and move. So we finally have enough money to build the gym. It'll be started this fall and the gym will open in the spring. So we are, as far as I know, the only Ciclo Sportif Grand Fondo event that's taking place this year. Um, everyone is canceled because of the, um, I don't know what you call them in English, but the sanitary passports, the green pass. Oh, the, 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 the um, or that you've had the PCR or whatever. Yeah. yeah so we, have passports. To, we have to ask people to have those if they want to come. Mm -hmm. um, what makes us different from other rides is that I hate trophies. So we have the local chocolate factory make us chocolate trophies. So you can eat. Oh, I love it. And every year <laughs> something different, like last couple of years ago, they made us a life-size jersey, one for the men, one for the women on a nougatine platform with a little cycling shoe or a high-heeled shoe next to it for the men and women. And it was just, ah! and their chocolate is phenomenal because they don't oh. use paraben or soy, it's cocoa and, and yeah, just yeah, yeah. chocolate. So we do that. And at the finish, there's beer and popcorn, <laughs> um, little cocktail. Yeah. And then Love it. we would have a dinner, but this year we were not allowed to have the dinner mm -hmm. because of the sanitary. Oh, well, sanitary. it sounds like you don't really need a dinner. Like you have oh. everything. You got chocolate, you got popcorn, you got beer. Yeah. There you what go. do you need? A <laughs> yeah. What do you need dinner for? So, yeah. So, right. yeah no. so that's going to happen on September 11th. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're still, uh, we're that, that, takes up a lot of Ooh, time it's coming it's up big organization yeah yeah mm -hmm. um at this year the difference is that we won't really know to the last minute if we'll be 30 or 300 at the start line because of mm -hmm. the covid and people i think are waiting to the last minute yeah. to sign up because they're afraid it'll be canceled and so yeah that's right and plus you don't want to have to refund or postpone and no, like move I mean, people and yeah yeah, that's. I find uh, that's a, the biggest hassle. Yeah. So, so that I mean that takes up a lot of time. There's still work to do on the house. I have to level out the yard. I'm building a terrace, so people on the bottom two floors will have their own private terraces. Tomorrow morning, I'm putting a lock on the. There's a a little cellar under the staircase, so people can lock their bikes in there. And oh. there's a. Um, uh, in, in French, it's called a carcher. Um, in English, it's, it's like a, a little cabin. Like a, no, a spray. Um, oh, thing. it's like a hose. Yeah, it's a hose, but with a lot a high pressured hose. Oh, high pressure. Yeah. Clean off your bike. So if you're doing gravel or mountain biking, or if you've ridden in the rain, you can clean your bike. Um, mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So that's nice. But there's just there's always stuff to do. I mean, and I even see here. Yesterday, I, I actually had a. A, a mental breakdown after trying to put together a um, a dresser, for, kind of like an IKEA type dresser, and oh. <laughs> I just I did something. I put one of the like the the back wall yeah, yeah. on backwards, and mm -hmm. once I realized it, I started just very delicately pushing little um, nails out so I could turn it around. And I turned around for two seconds to get a nail, and all of a sudden I heard. Boom! And the whole thing had just toppled over to the left and ripped out the wood and the nails at the bottom. It's all, oh. I must have fucked up on the bottom and missed a nail or something. <laughs> so that went to the bin and I had to start over. So I called up. Oh, no. Can I've... you come and help me? I can't do this. And I'm so tired of living out of my bags. And <laughs> So, uh, yeah. So I've, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of putting together part oh. of my kitchen from Ikea. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. It's just like, just a second. There's something yeah. wrong with this thing. Yes, take exactly. the whole thing apart, redo it. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you do put the drawer in upside down, you realize that. <laughs> yep. No, it's the back part. It's like, you, it's already in there. And you're like, I think there's something wrong. Yeah, something wrong with this picture. Why is this it's not, not wrong with this picture? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, um, yeah. So anyway, that's, I mean, there, I think that it'll be a never ending project. There's always mm -hmm. stuff. Oh yeah. Do. You'll always find things that you can. Yeah. make nicer you know people's but. experience better but oh my gosh so it's so I guess we'll just we're bringing this to an end like you've got so much stuff going on so if anybody yeah. is a around uh September 11th yes come to make the sure Japanese come to the make sure you what's the website for that we have um a Facebook page this will be oh, okay Facebook page is called La Marion Clignier. And once you're on the Facebook page, you'll yeah. find the link to the website. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm also. But that's where you're putting all the updates as well, I imagine. Yeah, that's where on we're that putting page. the updates, and there's yeah. a link to the courses. There's a link to the inscription. Um, we're having people sign up online, so we know that they've got the pass, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we have to scan with the QR code when they show up, um, so we know that they have the pass. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, just quickly, I'm also doing work with the syndicate of syndicates and associations in France to to help professionalize all women's sports and get mm. them to, to play the games so that you can see every bike race and cross country track race or whatever on the telly when you want. And, and not that would be nice, actually. Running. Yeah, it would. It would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so so we're working hard on that. Um, and, and just, you know, bringing up the leveling, the, the playing field, the breaking glass ceiling, all of that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's also a documentary on the first women's tour that's about to be filmed uh, by Jill Yesko, who had made another movie, I think called Tainted Blood. So she's oh. making a movie about the first women's tour between 84 and 89. Are um, you serious? Yes, I'm dead serious. Um, Do you know Debbie Jensen? Jensen? You mean Jensen? Jen yeah. No, Jensen. No. Um, she's from no. Canada. She did the 2000, uh, 1984 tour. Are you talking about Genevieve Jensen, who was Canadian? The young girl who- No, it was Donna, uh, Debbie Jensen. Okay, no, no, that I, I didn't race in 84. From 84. So. Okay, yeah, no, I wasn't racing then, but um, Inga Thompson is um, will be coming over for the filming. I'll put you in touch with the- yeah, with Jill, there's, um, and she'll be talking with Maria Canines um, on the trailer. She's got uh, Marianne Martin on there, who was the first uh, yellow jersey winner. And very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's quite cool. So I think it'll be a great movie. It's called um, an uphill climb, I think. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, no. I because um, I met Debbie. And uh, because she lives in Ottawa, she's also oh. part of the uh, one of the the other cycling organizations. Okay. And she had approached me about something else, and then we started talking. She's like, "Oh yeah, I I used to race back in the day," and I'm like, "Oh yeah, what?" And she's like, "Oh, it, I was one of the you know ladies who raced the Tour de France in '84," and I was just like, "Yeah, uh, Kelly <laughs> Anne like, as well, I think." Yeah. Debbie, Debbie. Oh, wait, what what was? um Jensen yeah no but she had a different name before didn't she wasn't it she, she has a different name now yes yes so her name Papri, back then Papri. was yeah. no it, back then was Debbie and but um and she's she's changed it now yes um yeah, yeah. but I interviewed her as well so it was it was kind of interesting to hear her story cool uh from that no I do remember the Can seeing photos of the Canadian team um mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'm trying. I see their faces, and I'm trying to think of the names. Well, I, I see, like, I look at your picture here, like way back, and <laughs> so they look very the similar. You know, with that those yeah. the um, <laughs> the helmets, the, helmets. helmets and the, yeah, yeah, that was '91. Yeah, with the helmets, that was. Oh, yeah. that was how can you imagine? Then, and, and we never. I mean, there was never an issue of riding without a helmet. I mean, that was just what we yeah, did. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. But. Um, anyway so it sounds like you're so busy I mean we would actually maybe in the new year we should have you back on to um love that. Yeah, give you and uh, give us all an update as yeah. to what's going on yes for a 2022 with the women and the organization everything that's moving forward with uh, uh women's equality and the tour and the new tour and uh yeah, yeah so Let's, I'll, I'll send you a message. Well, okay. we'll take this offline, but, if, but if yeah, you're... we'll have Miriam, Miriam back in on. the day. I will be able to show you the Oh, <gasps> yes. yes. You can give us a little visual <laughs> tour yes. on the video. Yes. That would be awesome. I know. Cause she's sitting there in the dark right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's four o'clock here. It's probably like nine there. <laughs> yep. And yeah, now it's 10 o'clock. Is it said? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to say you so thank much. you. And thank you to all of our listeners for, for taking in this episode. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe and follow. Cause like I said, you never know who I'm going to bring on here next and share this with somebody who you might have known who raced or was, you know, uh, on their bikes back in the day, back in the nineties. <laughs> 
eighties. <laughs> um, and don't forget to, like I said, follow. And because like I said, we're going to be bringing Miriam back in the new year and everyone have an amazing day. Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you. <laughs>